All right, Alexander, you're here. Um, it's, you're the only one here so far. Oh, here comes Cody. Um, the uh, the way that that uh, the review sessions generally run is I just let you guys guide it, whatever you guys want to um, want go over or do practice problems for. Just let me know, um, and we'll just keep working um, practice problems or going through stuff until you guys run out of questions. Um, so since you were here first, Alexander, you get first dibs on a uh, question if you have anything in particular. Uh, nothing in particular, just uh, was waiting for uh, just a little review on everything. But um, yeah, I can, uh, so everyone else can go first. All right, Cody, how about you? Do you have anything ready? Me? I said Cody. Oh, Cody, I was like. I'm looking for where I drew the question marks on here. It might take me just a minute. <laughs> All right. Elke, you ready? Um, yeah, I have a question. Um, so for number, or for section two, number 10, um, well, maybe we can just go over it. I have some specific questions about like positioning, um, like ortho para, because anyway, um, so, or maybe there's two molecules that we end up with at the end, but anyway, maybe we can just go through it or, All right. I don't know. Section two, number 10, well, that'd be the last reaction, right? Mm-hmm. All right, I'm getting it pulled up here. Okay. So this one is a little a little bit different. It has two strong deactivating groups on it and you don't have an electrophile, right? Your first reactant is gonna be the amide, which is a nucleophile, a pretty strong nucleophile. <clears throat> so if I was approaching this on a test and I had no idea where to start because that doesn't look like an electrophilic substitution, I would go to the two chapters on aromatic compounds in the textbook and check their reaction reviews to see if there was anything in particular that this um, looks like. And let's see, where did it go? So if I'm looking in the two chapters I'm thinking of in general are chapter 17, um, which is where we first started talking about organic, or sorry, aromatic compounds. Um, and nothing here really looks that similar. We have reactions at the benzylic position. And then we had catalytic hydrogenation in the birch reduction. This doesn't really look like either of those, right? So I'd move on to chapter 18. Check the review react review of reactions. This is all our electrophilic aromatic substitution. It's not one of those because we don't have an electrophile. If we keep going, we've got nucleophilic aromatic substitution, which it looks a little bit more likely. Um, and then we had elimination addition. So one of these two options. Um, fits pretty well. And they, they both could work, but remember there was, um, in particular, the nucleophilic aromatic substitution was a reaction that only happened if you had a nitro group in the para position, which going back to the problem, we did. We had a good leaving group. We had a nitro group in the para position and we had a strong base. It could act as a nucleophile. 
So we're going to do a nucleophilic aromatic substitution. So our first step here is going to be to replace that I with, um, with our nucleophile, which is the amide in this case. So we're gonna wind up making this compound as our intermediate. And then we have fuming H2SO4, which tells us we're going to be doing, we're going to be adding a sulfonate group. So when we're trying to decide where to add our SO3 group, we have a strong deactivator. In the nitro group, which is going to prefer to put it in the meta position. We have a strong activator in the amine group, which is gonna to prefer to put it in the ortho or para position. So for both of them, they're both suggesting putting it in the same spot. So our final product is gonna be tri-substituted. And it doesn't really matter which way you draw the, the sulfonate group, right? Because it could be in either of those two positions and it's, and it's identical. So I, don't, I might as well put it in the uh, position where it's less crowded. Right, and just remember, if if the nitro group and the amine group were were in opposition to each other, if they were contradicting each other, the one that's the stronger activator controls where your new substituent goes. Yeah, okay. I was just double checking that the sulfur does in fact attach where I, where I thought it should. All right, so any question, any more questions on this? How that clear up your concerns there, Elke? Yeah, I just, yeah, I wasn't sure if it did make a difference what position I put that on. Um, but yeah, that's what I got. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, yes, and the nice the nice thing about aromatics is aromatics are more complicated in a lot of ways because resonance can be tricky to wrap your head around. But on, at the same time, at least it's not like cyclohexane, right, where you have to worry about equ equatorial versus axial. Everything's flat, so if it looks the same on both sides, it probably is. All right, uh, Emily, do you have anything in particular? Um, yes, I was hoping we could go over the um, mechanism section, uh, section three, number one. All right, so key for these, for these mechanisms is, is to see the, um, if you know what type of reaction it is, especially on an open book test, um, then you can go, go find it, find the right chapter. So this is this is going to be an electrophilic, uh, electrophilic aromatic substitution. 
And for most of these, the first step was to make our Lewis acid or to use our Lewis acid to make our electrophile. So our first mechanism step is going to look like the two bromines and one of the two bromines is going to donate a pair of electrons to the iron. And that's going to make generate our electrophile because we wind up making this compound where you've got four bromines attached to the iron. Which puts, which means you've got a bromine uh, left over that's going to have a positive charge on it because you have two bonds on a bromine. Okay. And then being really careful with charges, that actually gives you a negative charge on the on the iron because the iron has an extra pair of electrons around it now compared to where it was. Um, that is not super important. Uh, at this point, but then the next step is going to be what kicks this whole thing off. Because now we can, um, we're going to wind up with the bromine that has the positive charge is going to wind up keeping a pair of electrons. And our bromine that is at the end is going to wind up uh, a, stealing a pair of electrons from the benzene ring. And typically, the way we draw this is um, that we would pick one of the one of the pi bonds that's uh, attached to the carbon that our bromine is going to attach to, which we have an OP director and a um, meta director that are both kind of in cooperation with each other. Um, so it probably makes the most sense to put it in the para position from the alkyl group or meta to the carbonyl. Okay. okay. So we can draw it, draw one of the pi bonds attacking the bromine there. So then we wind up making our new intermediate. is going to wind up looking like we still have the nothing changed here. And we're going to have a end up with a positive charge on one of the carbons. Right. And so then, and then that's that's that sigma complex um, that is going to have a whole bunch of different resonance structures. And ideally, you would remember to draw all three of the resonance structures, at least the ones that um, with the benzene ring, where you resonate that charge to the other carbons. Um, but it's not strictly speaking necessary because the most important thing is that our next step is going to be a hydrogen gets kicked off and you move the hydrogen, the carbon hydrogen bonds, electrons over to remake the benzene ring. Um, and you do kind of need a, a base, again, ideally. So if you had um, you could draw it like this.
And so those the hydrogens, electrons that move back over are going to reform the benzene ring. Right, so then that would give us our final product of. Mm. Isn't that, yeah, that's really easy. Okay, sorry. <laughs> no problem. Um, it's like like I keep saying, it's it's really easy as long as somebody is doing it with you, right? There's plenty of places to mess up though. And so for, for full credit, you would want to show that sigma complex with the three different resonance structures. Um, but if you didn't show that, if you just showed the go straight from here to kicking off the hydrogen, that would still be a 9 out of 10. Um, so drawing the sigma complex is um, ideal, but depending on your time situation, and how burnt out you're feeling when you get to a problem like this. Um, at least when I was a student, I would have looked at that and said, I'll take the one point hit. I don't need the one point that badly. And maybe if I have time, I'll come back and add it later. Um, yes, it's more important that you get enough time to do the rest of the test than it is to get that one point for drawing the whole sigma complex. Um, but again, that's just my personality type and how, who I was as a student. You guys make your own decisions on that. Uh, Stephanie, I think you were next. If you have anything in particular you wanted to go over. Yes, let me just find it real quick. Okay. Sorry, I woke up a little late today. <laughs> no problem. I had to get my son to the bus stop anyway. <clears throat> Uh, can we do section two, number five? I think it was. Sure, the alkyne? Yeah. Yeah, so this is a bit of a, of a throwback a little bit um, because we haven't dealt with alkyne reactions in a bit, except in the context of uh, a way to make carbonyls, specifically aldehydes and ketones. If we go through a hydration reaction, um, if it was an alkene, when we did a hydration reaction, we made an alcohol, right? But if it was an alkyne, when we do that hydration reaction, we wind up with an intermediate that looks like an enol. Um, and remember, so when you're looking at this, if you're not sure where to go with this, um, you know, I, I would I'd be looking at some of these other reactants. The ath the H2SO4 is probably going to be a um, a catalyst, just an acid catalyst. Water is a reactant. We had this mercury sulfate. We haven't done anything with attaching mercury to anything, right? So probably the if I was looking at this, I'd be looking at it and saying, okay, well, the water is probably going to be the reactant that actually makes new bonds because nothing else on there is um, is anything that that we dealt with when it comes to making new bonds with alkynes. So we would make this enol intermediate, which you don't need to show, it, the, um, it's still the same net reaction as doing a hydration with an alkene. Um, it's just, we make this enol instead, which then rearranges itself. To make a ketone. All right, and so since I'm in, so in terms of test taking strategy, you know that there's only four chapters in this in this uh, section, and alkynes was not one of them. So if I was looking at this, trying to figure out where to go, um, and trying to check my my reactions, it's definitely not one of the aromatic reactions. It definitely is not an acid derivative reaction necessarily. 
Um, so, I, but I would be looking at, um, remember each of these chapters has a section on, um, on how to make that, those particular compounds. So if I was looking through the chapter in a, in a hurry trying to find this, um, if I go to a review of reactions, we might not see it because all these look like the ketones and the aldehydes reacting to make other things. Um, but back at the beginning of the chapter, there was a section on preparing aldehydes and ketones. And it says a review. So it's going to be referencing other things. And so if you start looking here, there's um, oxidation of primary alcohols, ozonolysis of alkenes, hydroboration. Oh, wait, that's an alkyne. Is that what we're looking for? And then look at it and say, ah, oh, no, that's going to give me the anti Markovnikov. Versus if you have look over on the other side, you've got our reaction right here H2SO4, H2O, mercury sulfate. That takes an alkyne and converts it to a ketone. All right, so finding these and understanding how the textbook and the some of these reactions are are organized um, is is a pretty significant chunk of of knowing what to do. It's like anything else um, these days. If you know where to look it up, anything's easy to learn about, right? But it's a matter of of understanding the framework and kind of knowing how things are organized is how you know what to look for and where to look for it. Um, so. If you, in a time situation, if you couldn't find that or something like that, and you just gave it your best go, um, at the very least, I'd be looking, I'd be looking to, to make an intermediate that I know is going to react with the second step here, so I can at least get some credit. Because if you get the wrong intermediate, you get the wrong molecule here, but you take your wrong molecule and you interpret the next step properly. I can still give you credit for the second half of that reaction then. So even if you have no idea what this first reaction is, draw something that's going to react with, with an amine with acid. So since we saw a lot of carbonyls reacting with that, draw some sort of carbonyl because then you can take this and turn it into something else. So even if you totally botched it and you thought, oh, that's ozonolysis when it clearly isn't. Um, if it was ozonolysis, you'd be making a carboxylic acid, which then you could still say is going to react with an amine to make a product. And I can give you at least full credit for the second half of the reaction or the second reaction of the two. Um, but so, so as to not confuse the matter, I'll draw the right product. So we got the, the ketone. And when we had a primary amine, reacting with a keat with a carbonyl with a class 2 carbonyl we took the we we're going to break the carbonyl bond and we're we're going to replace it with a carbon nitrogen double bond so we're making an imine and the r group stays on the nitrogen So you don't need to show the intermediate where you have the alcohol, where you wind up with and you know the nitrogen attached here and the OH here. You don't need to show that in the rearrangement that happens. For these, for these reactions on section two, I just want the final product for these. Um, it could it might be helpful for you to show the intermediate just as a means of, of organizing what's happening but it's not necessary for full credit, right? And you don't need to draw any, re any mechanism arrows in this section. Unle again, unless it's helpful for you, you can, have, you can do it. And if you draw the wrong react mechanism arrows or the wrong intermediate, I'm not gonna grade that as long as you have the next step properly in there. Okay, thank you. No problem. Uh, Adam. Do you have anything in particular? Not really. Okay. Then we'll start back at the beginning and just keep going through here. 
Alexander, you got any questions yet? Uh, no, just, uh, um, let me see. I don't mean to put anybody on the spot. You guys are totally welcome to just be here and and uh, absorb the chemistry um, by being in the Zoom room um, without uh, coming up with your own questions. But I just want to make sure everybody has a chance to ask questions if they have any. All right, Cody, how about you? Yeah, I'm a little bit confused about um... I think it's section two, number two, with the diketone. Number three. Number three, excuse me. Um, I feel like the sodium borohydride is going to reduce one of those carbonyls to an alcohol group, since you only got one equivalent, probably only one of them. Absolutely right. And then the second step is where I'm a little bit confused. Um, because you could do an acid catalyzed hydration where you you convert that other carbonyl into a diol, or maybe something else. I don't know. Because it's minus H two O, that's where I'm a little bit confused. Yeah, if it's a minus H two O, you should be looking for some type of of um, either. If you do have an alcohol around, you could make an acetal like you mentioned, and lose a water from the from this remaining ketone. But if you're not given a specific alcohol, you should just be looking at it as, well, if it says minus H2O, it's an elimination reaction. And just treat it as a, as a regular elimination reaction. You're going to protonate your ox, the oxygen on the alcohol and remove uh, an adjacent Um, remove an adjacent hydrogen, and you're just going to wind up making an alkene. If I gave you a specific alcohol, especially if I say excess, now you're making an acetal. Right, so in that case, it would look like you leave your OH on one side, you're losing the oxygen as water from the other ketone. So you wind up making that, that acetal, which again is that diether attached where the carbonyl was. <clears throat> And that's kind of where I wanted to go with it, but I'm glad I double checked. Um, and realistically, that's that's probably where I wanted students to go with it last year, but I forgot to put the alcohol in there. So you have to deal with what I give you, right, on the test. You're always welcome to ask questions, but if if I don't respond fast enough to you, um, so the the right answer to the way it was written would have been to make the alkene, just do the elimination reaction. This would have been a better question to ask because it's more relevant to what we've studied. And I think I didn't give any any um, bad questions like this when I rewrote the test this year. I think I caught all those, but there's always one or two um, that I that I missed. So on the test, you can either treat it the way that it was written and just say, And, and just write the elimination product. Um, the other option would be, would be to say something like, I think that you're talking about this reaction and just either pick an alcohol or just say, I, you know, write it in there. I think you meant to ask this question. Um, you don't wanna do that too much because if I actually wrote the question right and you do that, then I can't give you as much credit. But if I do actually leave something out and you're pretty sure about that, um, you can always do that and then and do that um, you know, to an extent. I'm not gonna let you rewrite the whole test just to make it so that it only features the reactions that you wanna ask me to ask about. Um, but that's that's always an option too. 
Cool. If I could squeeze a second question in here, I got another one ready to go. Sure. It's the uh, the number of pi electrons. I assume you're talking about the electrons that can participate mm -hmm. in resonance or something. Correct. So number of pi electrons, any delocalized electrons, we're going to consider pi electrons because they're going to be in in uh, unhybridized p orbitals um, that are conjugated and resonating with the others. So uh, it's not just the ones that are already in pi bonds, pi electrons are any delocalized lone pairs would also get included in that. Right, so, and that goes back to our definition of an aromatic compound, right? When we said um, you had to have an odd number of electron pairs, remember Huckel's rule? Because you have to have an odd number of electron pairs that are in this conjugated system. So anything that's in that conjugated system would be considered a pi electron. And I think I remember you saying that nitrogen that's got a double bond as part of like a ring structure that those that pair is not delocalized, so it's not part of it. Correct. Um, and and that so that comes from the fact that if you have multiple, if you have a a set of let me go to the board here. Um, if you have a, a bunch of pi electrons, every atom can only contribute one pair of electrons to the pi system. Because if you have, say, a nitrogen that's got a double bond that looks like a, a pi bond, so let's just say the rest of the molecule is this way. <clears throat> and so we've got nitrogen participating in a pi bond right here. Um, and then it has another, another bond going off the other way that's to the rest of the ring structure. The nitrogen's third electron group is this lone pair that's pointed off and it has to be 90 degrees from the unhybridized p orbitals because you can't you only have one set of p orbitals that are pointed in this direction along this axis there is no other piece of the p orbital that you could mix in that's also pointed in the same direction so the fact that you you wind up with your lone pair being 90 degrees from the rest of this. Um, and it's mathematically, it's what we call orthogonal, which is a fancy way of saying um, 90 degrees. And if you're in linear algebra, it also means that they're um, linearly independent, meaning you can't mix this in with these other orbitals. They literally can't resonate because of the orientation and the, the rules for how these matrices work. Right, so you will only ever have one pair of electrons at most per atom. Right, so if you have something like if you have something like the nitrogen in the bottom here, the nitrogen's lone pair is not part of this, is not part of the, the resonance structure. But the sulfur up here, the sulfur doesn't have any pi bonds drawn yet, right? So the sulfur can have one of its lone pairs can participate. Not both of them, but one of them. Right, because one of them can have that same shape where it's up and down in an unhybridized p orbital that's pointed in the same direction of, as the existing p orbitals. But the other one, by definition, is going to have to be 90 degrees from that. All right. Any, did that uh, satisfy your question yeah. there, Cody? Yeah. Thank you. Any, anybody else with, with um, pi electron questions while we're on the topic? 
you pretty much answered it, but I've actually been wondering this since like quarter one, you would never say that, like you could just say one set of electrons and just that's all you have to say. Cause I feel like all the way back in quarter one, I would say like both could, but only one at a time. That's just not necessary, right? Yeah, you're, it's, um, it's semantics a little bit. You're technically correct, but why bother differentiating between them when they're, we can't tell the difference between the pairs of electrons anyway. Um, so it doesn't really matter which one we pick to show as being part of the resonance structure. So might as well just say one of them is participating. Yeah. All right. Mm. Let's see if there's a, if I get a good figure here that shows what I want to This is an all right figure. Um, this just shows what I was discussing a little bit. So if you see that you've got these pi bonds and the way they're drawn, you've got one pi bond here another pi bond here, and the oxygen has two lone pairs, but only one of them can be pointed in the same direction as the other p orbitals. And this one that's pointed in the other direction just literally is, it, by being perpendicular and orthogonal, means that there is zero overlap in terms of the orbitals. So it's not participating at all doesn't even matter that there's an extra elect, uh, lone pair there because it can't resonate. Remember when we were doing the um, electrocyclization reactions, we had those Woodward-Hoffman rules for how things could rotate. Um, there, are, there are sets of rules for how orbitals can interact with each other as well. Um, and so we, we would just, um, it, we would basically say that those, that other, lone pair is forbidden from interacting in the with the pi structure um, by the nature of it being orthogonal because it's 90 degrees and pointed in perpendicular direction it's it's forbidden it's a forbidden transition to have it part part of a resonance structure All right, Elki, you have any any other questions you wanted to go over? Um, yeah, I do. Um, oh well, <clears throat> part four um, of section one would be good. Just to make sure I got it right. Um, I think I did, but just to make sure. Yeah, um, and, and then I, I mean, I have a couple other questions, but. Maybe yeah, we can do part four. Yeah, for... we and we'll keep going round robin too. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. But so you'll you'll get more chances um, as well. Let me. Did I pull out that um, that table and post it? The electron withdrawing. Or I did not do that yet. Um, all right. Well then, while we are doing this, let me get that pulled up and I'll get that saved so that you have that available. And I'll post that to, to this week's um, week overview. So you have that uh, table of this table. All right, so that's not what I meant to do. So table 18.1, if you're using the textbook, it's on page 814. Sorry, you said it was 18 um, what? Table 18.1, it's in section 18.10. Page, page um, eight, 814 of the print textbook. Um, let me just, while we're doing this,
apparently the last figure that I saved out of here was from chapter 10, anti-Markovnikov Romanation. Uh, we're now at chapter 18. All right. Good. So if you have this table in front of you, this question is not too tricky. It's, um, and you can, there, there is a good um, rule. For this, which is if there's a conjugated pi bond, it's electron withdrawing, which also means it's deactivating and it's a meta director. Hang on. There we go. All right, so that's available now. Um, and again, what we're really looking for is if you have if you have um, a lone pair conjugated with the pi bond. So if, if your atom that's directly attached to the benzene has a lone pair, it's going to be an activator, and it's going to be an ortho para director. If you have a pi bond conjugated with the benzene ring, it's going to be a deactivator and it's going to be a meta director. So for this problem, we have one of each. This top section, you've got a pi bond that's conjugated with the benzene ring, which means it's going to be electron withdrawing because all the resonance structures that we could draw are going to involve pulling electrons away from the benzene ring and putting a positive charge on the benzene ring somewhere. And so if I was going to draw a resonance structure here, I can't, I can't move the pi bonds away from the oxygen because the oxygen has a full valence. And if I did something like this, To make a resonance structure, I'd wind up pulling, um, having an oxygen with an incomplete valence, which is very unfavorable. So all of our reactions, all of our resonance structures instead are going to look like this. So we get a resonance structure that where you've got a negative charge on the oxygen. and positive charge somewhere on the benzene ring. All right, so, and this is why the difference, this is why the conjugated pi bonds are always gonna be electron withdrawing because those conjugated pi bonds are always gonna lead to resonance structures with a positive charge on the benzene ring. Uh, and a positive charge on the benzene ring means it's less likely it's not going to go electrophilic substitution at those positions. So essentially these three carbons are now off limits for electrophilic substitution because they all have a partial positive on them due to the resonance structures. And if it's got a partial positive, it's not going to be attractive to an electrophile, right? Electrophiles are looking for electrons. So this is, it all comes back to the pi bond versus the lone pair because a pi bond conjugated is going to slow things down and only allow things to substitute in the meta positions based on the resonance structures, right? So as far as answering this question on the test, you don't need to do all that for this test. Um, if we just say that, Here's our substituent, it's electron withdrawing.
Um, and that can just come strictly from looking at this chart. An aldehyde attached to a benzene ring is a moderate deactivator. It's down here in this electron withdrawing. And basically anything that's a deactivator If it's a deactivator, it's also electron withdrawing. And if it's an activator, it's electron donating. Right, so um, I keep using these terms almost interchangeably, but activators by definition are electron donating, deactivators are electron withdrawing. And so again, back to answering this question, electron withdrawing. And then you would say, okay, if it's electron withdrawing, it's also going to be deactivating because it's pulling electrons away. So an electrophile is less attractive. So something about, for the explanation part, something about less electron density means electrophiles are not as attracted to it. And then last part, circle the carbons that are likely to undergo electrophilic substitution. Well, if you drew you, the uh, resonance structures, as part of your explanation for part B, then that actually answers part C as well, because then you can just circle the metacarbons, because those are the ones that don't wind up with a positive charge on them in, a, in any of the resonance structures. Because remember that those charges are going to alternate carbons. When you draw your resonance structures, the way the electrons are moving means that the positive charges are going to go on the ortho positions and the para position. And so the positions that don't get a positive charge on them in the resonance structure are the ones that you can do a substitution on. Um, and frankly, I would, I think drawing the resonance structure is probably the best way to answer B and because it answers both of them at the same time. If you, for your electron withdrawing substituents, draw the resonance structures that have the positive charges on the OP carbons. And then that also answers C. On the flip side, if you have an electron donating substituent, if you have an activating substituent, it, it has lone pairs already. You, you're not gonna resonate any electrons towards this oxygen, even though the oxygen is electronegative, it's already got a full valence, right? So you can't give that oxygen any more electrons because it already has two lone pairs attached here too. So all of the resonance structures that you could get from anything with a lone pair, are going to be moving the lone pair towards the benzene ring. Even though oxygen is electronegative, it literally doesn't have any room to accept any more electrons. So because it has those lone pairs, all of our resonance structures are going to be, have a, a negative charge on the benzene ring. So we get a resonance structure that looks like this. So, and because the charges are reversed now, we wind up 
with a system where we're giving electrons to the benzene ring, which makes it more attractive to an electrophile. And it, we get the exact same logic here, except with the opposite effect. Because it's a negative charge resonating around the benzene ring on the ortho and the para positions, those ortho and the para positions are more attractive to an electrophile. So if it's an activating group, if it has lone pairs that can resonate, it's going to um, be an activator because it's more attractive to an electrophile and it's going to undergo those substitutions at the O and the P positions. Right, so the resonance structures are going to look almost identical except for the charges flipped. How are we feeling about this one now? And this this pertains specifically to electrophilic substitution, nucleophilic substitution, no activating, deactivating, elimination, addition, nothing, no. Um, there's still there are still elements of it that show up there, but this table, yes, is specifically talking about about electrophilic substitution, but the the idea of of electron donating versus electron withdrawing that shows up everywhere that shows up all over the place that showed up in our aldehyde one with the vitig reaction right where we talked about um if it was electron donating you got the you got the trans isomer and if it was electron um withdrawing then you got the the cis isomer. Um, and it does show up as well in even in this chapter with the nucleophilic aromatic substitution. Um, you needed a strong electron withdrawing group in order for that to happen, right? You needed a nitro group on there in the para position so that it could suck all the electron density away from the other side of the benzene ring. So these terms continue to show up. This specific table is talking about electrophilic aromatic substitution, but we're going to keep using those terms, electron donating and electron withdrawing, um, because they do, and, and we'll use the same definitions, basically. Lone pairs that can resonate are electron donating. Pi bonds that are conjugated are electron withdrawing. All right, Emily, I think you're next in our lineup, right? Do you have anything for me? Um, I actually kind of, I know like, we're gonna like, everyone has different turns and stuff, but um, I would really like to go over pretty much all of section two um, throughout this, because I just wanna make sure I got them right. Okay. So if we could um, start a new one, that would be awesome. Yeah. and. Uh, I have not had a chance. I didn't finish writing the test till about 1030 last night. Um, so I have not had a chance to write the key for this, but that is on my list of things to do today. Um, we can do it, it right now. How about? Let's do it. All right. So let's look at number one here. Might as well start at the beginning, right? We've done it and we'll skip the ones we've already gone over. Um, we've got a methyl group and a bromine already on a benzene ring. And then we have an acid chloride with AlCl3, which is a Lewis acid. Lewis acids are going to activate our electrophiles. So what we're going to be doing here is taking this carbon is an, is a, an electrophile and is going to be attached to the benzene ring. Um, we just have to figure out where to put it because bromine and, and uh, R groups are both OP directors. Um, the difference is, is that bromine is an electron withdrawing group just because of electronegativity. Um, and the methyl group is electron donating. And push comes to shove when these things are battling each other, electron donating controls the show. More 
activate the stronger activating agent controls where we're putting things. So we're adding it here or there. Um, and they're identical positions. So we've got our methyl, our benzene ring, our bromine still in the same spot. Don't forget the rest of your carbons. I know I have a tendency to do that from time to time, but if you miscount your carbons, I do, I do have to take points away, even if you get most of the reaction right. So then, so that's our intermediate or our, our first step. Then the second step, and this one, I will be more careful to write it out as zinc, mercury, alloy because it is, it's not zinc or mercury, it's zinc with mercury. Um, and I'll, so I'll be more careful to write that out. Um, and what that reaction does is it takes any, any uh, aldehydes or ketones, any carbonyls in the benzylic position, and it fully reduces them. So our final product here, and I'm gonna clear this just so that I can have enough room to draw things. I so probably shouldn't yet make sure I don't miss anything. Just saw the benzene ring. We still have that isopropyl group that I didn't really leave myself enough room to draw. We're just getting rid of the, the oxygen. It's just getting that oxygen, carbon oxygen double bond is just being turned to carbon hydrogen bonds. So we just wind up with two alkyl groups and a bromine on our benzene ring there. Do you know the name of this reaction? I believe that's the Clemenson reduction. Okay. And might as well check that real quick while we're here. I think it was in the, in chapter 17. No. In that case, it was on, it was in chapter 19. That one. So reaction 10, yeah, Clemenson reduction. All right. So for number two, excess sodium dichromate. Um, sodium dichromate is one of those reactions at the benzylic position. It was the reaction where if you have any hydrogens on a benzylic carbon, it's going to take that and it's going to oxidize it fully all the way to a carboxylic acid. And whatever else is there just gets chopped off and lost. So we're getting rid of all that. And we're going to turn this into a di dioic acid. Um, and those extra carbons just wind up being, if I'm remembering correctly, I believe they just get fully oxidized and they just get turned to CO2 or some other random byproducts um, that are not particularly relevant for this one. This is not like ozonolysis where you get nice clean um, cleavage between two, between two pieces. You just chop it off and get rid of it. Uh, and then once we have these carboxylic acids, lithium aluminum hydride is a strong reducing agent in a, in a hydride source. So we're just going to take these two carboxylic acids 
and they get oxidized all the way down to an alcohol for both of them. Um, so we're just going to wind up with They're still in the same position. Um, key is to remember you're not making this, turning them into phenols. They're still primary alcohols because you're not getting rid of the carbons that were the carboxylic acids. The car those carbons are still there. So your OHs are not directly attached to the benzene ring. Um, and anytime you see excess, if you have two groups that can react, um, there's a decent chance you're going to see the same thing happen in both spots. And just as a side note, You've actually used this compound, the carboxylic acid, benzene dioic acid. The common name for that is phthalic acid, PHTH. Which you used in GenChem when you did um, your, actually, you guys might have missed out on this, depending on if you took, if you took Gen Chem last year, last spring, you might not have gotten to do the titration where you had to standardize one of your um, solutions um, and use the compound called KHP. KHP stands for potassium hydrogen phthalate, which is the, the um, partially deprotonated form of this compound. Um, so it's a really common compound. It gets used a lot in um, general chemistry as a way to make sure that you know your concentrations of your acid very, very carefully. Um, but uh, now I'm thinking that's, that that might not have been something that you guys got a chance to do. If you ever take analytical chemistry, um, which is basically a class that you take after organic chemistry, and it's basically a class on um, how do we measure how much we have of something with as many sig figs as possible? Um, and you will do a ridiculous number of titrations in the, that class. And that's the first chemistry class where you actually get graded on um, getting the right answer in your labs. Um, the, uh, the TA will have to go through and actually standardize all the solutions and get the final answer right. Um, and you'll get graded based on how close you get to the right answer which is kind of fun because it actually, you know, puts a little bit of a, uh, um, you actually have to pay attention to what you're doing with your trials for your titrations and things like that. Um, and KHP and phthalic acid are a very, very big part of that. Make sure that you get your solutions concentration right. Hey, Sean. Yeah. Um, what are the conditions for um, an excess sodium chromide and... Um the sul sulfate and H2O, what would that would cause no reaction? Um, if, there, if there is not a hydrogen on the benzylic carbon, so if we had two other methyl groups attached mm -hmm. here, then there's no hydrogens on that carbon, right? Yeah. Which, and if there's no hydrogens, you can't turn it into a carboxylic acid. So that would just not react at that point. You would wind up making the bottom one would react to make the carboxylic acid. Mm -hmm. And the top one would just stay as it is. Okay. All right. So yeah, you, you, I, you need a benzylic hydrogen in order for that to happen. All right, how are we doing every, everything, everybody else? Does anybody else want to jump in and, and uh, ask a question about a different section before we just keep going on these? Especially if you've only got, if I've only asked you once. Um, 
taking uh, silence to mean that you're okay with our current trajectory. We'll just keep going through these, these uh, reactions. Cool. All right, well, we did three. And again, if it's one equivalent of sodium borohydride, you're only going to reduce one of these ketones. If I said two equivalents, you'd be making, you'd be reducing both of them or excess. Um, if we are reacting, we have another Lewis acid, AlCl3. Um, so this is going to be an alkylation instead of an acylation. So the a an acyl group has a carbonyl attached to it. So going back to question one, this was an acylation, A-C-Y-L, acyl, because we're adding a carbonyl. Um, and we get better yields with those, generally speaking, um, but alkylations can still happen. Um, so we, if you see, it's the same reaction, essentially, just without the carbonyl attached to your chloride. Um, and so it's going to go through the same general process. We're, tr we're going to be attaching this carbon, doing a substitution somewhere on the benzene ring. That's an OP director. Um, and it's an activator. So we're going to be trying to put our methyl group either in an O or a P position. The fact that it's a big bulky group means if we're going to pick just one major product, it's probably going to be the P, um, because just because of the sterics. But it wouldn't be wrong to write to write both possibilities. So there would be our primary product from step one. Again, if you wrote, if you put it in the O position as well, if you wrote both of them, that would still be full credit as well, because you will get some of that. It's just going to favor the para position because of the sterics. Which means our next step. Hold on, Sean. Why, mm -hmm. um, when I did this, I, um, added my chlorine to the bottom. Is that wrong? Yes, that is wrong. Okay. So remember how that, so to, to explain why, um, our, our electrophile generation, when we make our electrophile, it's gonna look like this, this Lewis acid is then bonding to the chloride, which is still attached to the methyl group. So you would wind up with a positive charge there, a negative charge on the aluminum. So that this carbon is the electrophile. The chlorine is attached to the aluminum. So the chlorine is not our electrophile. Um, if we did this reaction where instead of the methyl chloride, if you did it with Cl2, now it's a chlorination reaction because now we have this as our electrophile, right? So it's, it's all about what's attached to the chlorine. If the chlorine has another chlorine attached, it's chlorination. If the chlorine has an acyl group or an alkyl group, then you're doing um, one of those Friedel-Crafts reactions. Right, so we have here's our intermediate. If we're exposing this to excess N bromosuccinamide, this was on one of our on our list of reactions that happen at the benzylic position. All the way back, actually, when we talk about free radical reactions, NBS is going to preferentially add a bromine uh, in a position that's conjugated with a pi bond. So if it was an alkene, we'd be adding a bromine in the allylic position. 
if it's a benzene ring, we're adding it in the benzylic position. But we have to be able to replace a hydrogen to do that. So just like Emily's question on, I think it was number two, um, if there's no benzylic hydrogen, you can't put the bromine there. So we can't do anything with that T-butyl group. The fact that it's excess tells us that we're going to we're going to do it three times. We're going to place all of the benzylic hydrogens with bromines. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hello. Let me fix that three. So we're adding all three of those hydrogens are being replaced, right? And if, there, if it was an ethyl group instead of a methyl group, there would only be two hydrogens to replace there. So we'd be making a CBr2 with the methyl still attached. If it was an isopropyl group, we'd only be adding one bromine, right? Because we have to be able to replace a hydrogen for this reaction to happen. And we can only do it as many times as we have benzylic hydrogens. And so for the sake of demonstrating, if we did have um, a ethyl group there instead, we would wind up with that as our product. If it was an isopropyl group, we only have one hydrogen we can replace. And so it would just be one bromine added there. A little bit, okay. You can get a book and read over here. Go get a book from your room. Or you can read that, that's fine. All right, so questions on this one. Any details I left out? Cool. Five we looked at. Again, it's just a um, um The trickiest part about this one was remembering that this that uh, this was going to make an L a um, ketone, and where you're putting your carbonyl. As soon as we can recognize one of those functional groups from, from chapter 19, um, so the aldehydes chapter, we had a whole bunch of different reactions of these aldehydes and ketones, um, and most of them were reversible. So the second you can recognize any of these as your reactant is not any of them. Um, you can't reduce the these ones as much. Um, so I guess specifically, these functional groups can all be hydrolyzed and turned back to a carbonyl. And the only reactant you need for that is, is H3O plus, right? So the second you can recognize one of those functional groups and the reaction is just H3O plus, you're turning it back into the ketone or the aldehyde. So in this case, it's an acetal. So we're gonna be chopping those oxygens off and replacing it with a carbonyl. And remember that the carbon that has two oxygen bonds is the one that the, gets the carbonyl. So we're gonna wind up with that molecule plus a side reaction um, where we're gonna get the rest of this just gets turned back into a diol. diol.
not as relevant for the rest of the reaction, but still a good idea to, to write it in there. Um, and side note on this, uh, I have the luxury of being able to write these in there and then hit clear when I go to the next one and not make myself too crowded. Um, if you wanted to do this on scratch paper or binder paper and give yourself as much room as you need for these reactions, that's totally fine. Um, you don't have to, to print this off and just do it in the space I give you because I don't, I'm almost certain I don't give you enough space on these. Um, so uh, take all the space you need um, to make sure that you can write in everything that you want to write. Don't uh, don't limit yourself that way. All right, so for the next part of this reaction, it's a Wittig reaction, which is that um, is going to be taking the pieces that are attached to the phosphorus are going to turn around and get attached in place of the oxygen. So we're going to make an alkene. And if one side of your alkene is symmetrical, it doesn't matter whether you're making the cis or the trans. Right? It doesn't matter which way the ethyl group is facing because the cyclopentyl group is symmetrical. So our product would wind up looking like that. Just don't forget you're adding all of those carbons, including the one directly attached to the phosphorus. Don't lose track of how many, how many carbons you have when you do this. As I should have asked before I cleared that. Any questions on this one? Once the ones where you can recognize the reaction type where they're really distinctive are aren't that bad, right? It's a matter of recognizing the reaction type and knowing what you're dealing with. And the Wittig reactions actually make that pretty easy because we only have one thing that has anything to do with phosphorus, right? So my question is that um, ethyl group, or I guess so three carbons there, does it matter how we orient it? Okay. Not for this one, because, because this cyclopentyl group is totally symmetric. Okay. If we'd had something like this, now it does matter because you could get two possibilities. And so then you have to remember, okay, with the Wittig reaction, electron, electron withdrawing means that you're going to, I don't want to say it the wrong way. So let me make sure that I get it right. We'll check that. Um, it's, it has to do with, with whether or not these two carbons or the carbons that are attached to there are electron donating or electron withdrawing. And I'm pretty sure I can do it from memory, but I don't want to steer you the wrong direction. So let me... Let's make sure we get that right. And so if it's an electron withdrawing group, we wind up, or so electron donating, you get the Z. And if it's electron withdrawing, you get the E. <clears throat> based on, and it's gonna be based on the steric. So whatever, we have electron, wrong, an electron donating group. So we're going to wind up with that electron donating, and I just looked at it and it just went right out of my head. Electron donating gives you the Z. I hate that feeling. It's like when you ask somebody their name and as soon as they say their name, it just goes right through your brain and out the other side. So in this case, we would wind up making 
that isomer. But as long as it's symmetrical, it doesn't really matter. As long as one or the other of our substituents is symmetrical. <clears throat> All right, how are we doing? Do you guys want to take a break and come back and keep working on this? Let's take a break. I'm gonna get some water, refresh your coffee. Um, let's come back at quarter till. And I have office hours after this, so I don't mind just hanging out and going through this until we're done. Um, so yeah, 10 minutes, come back at quarter till and we'll keep keep working. So we're going to get into a little bit of the protein folding and stuff this quarter. Probably not protein folding. Um, if we have time, then then I'd like to get into some of the carbohydrate chemistry because there are some specific like, tests that we do with um, um, that are OCHEM related that referring to things like um, they call them um, reducing sugars versus non-reducing sugars um, that have to do with whether or not it's an aldose or a ketose. Um, so that basically when it's in its open chain form, is it a ketone or an aldehyde? Um, if we have time, we'll get to those, but I'm not sure if, if we do, we'll see. There's some stuff, some other stuff we have to get to first. Sorry about that, man. Internet didn't want to cooperate. No, uh, no worries. Uh, I was just saying, yeah, that, um, hopefully we'll get into at least some of the um, carbohydrate chemistry because there are some some things that are specific to like different types of, of sugars, for instance, uh, aldoses versus ketoses, um, which are, just refers to a ketose means when it's in its open chain form, it's a ketone. And an aldose is when it's in its open chain form, it's an aldehyde. Um, so like, if I'm remembering properly, uh, glucose is an aldose, but fructose is a ketose, um, despite having the same formula. The only difference is where you put the double bond. Hmm. Um, and so hopefully we'll get into some of that, but uh, no guarantees because there's some other stuff we have to get through first. Um, yeah, in, in particular, there's there's one more big topic we have to get out, get through and then um hopefully we'll get into talking um we'll have time to do that the carbohydrate chemistry um but yeah you you really won't don't see the protein folding till uh again till you get to upper division biochem if you took the intro to biochem so you have a, at least a little idea we wouldn't have time to get into it in more depth than that anyway right now but upper division biochem is essentially an entire course on protein folding and and at mechanisms of enzymes um so you'd have lots of time there um i remember really liking that class for that reason i think enzyme kinetics was my least favorite part of that too many charts <laughs> yeah when you'll get back to that too as well but uh um it's yeah when you see it the second time it makes a lot more sense and when you when we have time to be a little bit more rigorous with it um, and it does explain a lot of things in, in a way that's kind of 
uh, that's that's helpful. Um, but all right, I'm gonna hop off for a second though and answer some emails.
All right, folks. Let's keep on trucking here. So we finished number six. Um, number seven. So key here is recognizing once again that that we've a, we have a peroxy acid. Remember, there there have been a few reactions that were re really really specific to peroxy acids. Um, so when you recognize that this is a peroxy acid. Um, that gives us a pretty uh, a pretty good indication of what we're trying to do next, which is we're going to turn this ketone into an ester. And so then it's a matter of of which of where do we put the oxygen on which side? Do we move the methyl or do we move the the phenyl group? And it follows along with stability rules. The phenyl group is more stable as a carbocation than the methyl group is. So we're gonna move the phenyl group and insert the oxygen on that side. Mm -hmm. So then the second part of this reaction is actually the, involves the other part of this molecule. It's not going to be the ester that reacts. Now we're actually, um, we've got iron and bromine. The iron can act as a Lewis acid. The bromine is going to act as an electrophile. So we're going to wind up brominating the benzene ring. And now that we've inserted this oxygen in here that has lone pairs conjugated, that tells us it's an OP director. So we're gonna, and again, based on sterics, probably the, the P is gonna be preferential here. So we're gonna wind up with brominating the benzene ring and the ester stays where it is. All right, so lots of small places that you could mess up there. Um, you know, don't worry, I won't be too harsh if you get the OP director part wrong. The most important part of this is recognizing the overall reaction type and getting the, the right functional groups added. Um, you know, for full credit, of course, I want you to add them in the right spot. Um, but the main thing is recognizing the reaction types. That's going to be the bulk of the points in these sections. Would that just put one bromine on there, or would you wind up doing three of them because you got excess? I guess it does say excess, right? Usually we, we write the excess when we're using um, iron as the Lewis acid, you have to have excess bromine. Just because the first thing you do is you have to turn the iron all the way into FeBr3, and then you can generate your your uh, electrophile. But you're right; if it's enough of an excess, oops, then you are absolutely cre correct. I don't know what's happening now. Um, we would be putting the the bromine on in all three positions, so we would be. We'd be looking at at that as our final product. Um, and if we were, if I was more specific about the the stoichiometry, if I said um, just Br two and Fe Br three as our reactants, then that might we might only brominate it in one spot with but without it being specific and it's saying excess then yeah your, your best bet would be to brominate all of the possible places
Questions there? Everybody remember that term migratory aptitude? That was one that follows our rules for carbocation stability. So if you have a hydrogen, the hydrogen moves. Um, faster than anything else. If you don't have a hydrogen, then look for a tertiary carbon and your tertiary carbon is gonna move faster. If you don't have tertiary, then either secondary or a phenol or a phenolic, um, a phenyl group would be the next. And then primary, then methyl um, would be the slowest to move, right? So that's how you know which side of the ketone gets, um, gets the oxygen. All right, so this one is a kind of a long one that involves some, some review. We're starting from acetylene and we're going to expose the acetylene to amide. That was our way of deprotonating a terminal alkyne and turning it into an acetylide ion, right? So after step one, We're going to make a strong nucleophile here, which then can attack step two. And we're just going to add another carbon to it. It's just going to do an SN, SN2 reaction with the methyl iodide. And then we have a hydroboration. Steps three and four um, are two steps for the same reaction. That was our hydroboration, which was anti-Markovnikov hydration. So we're going to be adding an oxygen on the least substituted carbon. And then because it's an alkyne, that means that we're going to be turning it into a, an aldehyde. So we're wind up with this as our intermediate after the the first four sections here so propanol would be our product All right, so then next up, now we're into a carbonyl compound, which now we know which chapter we're looking at as well. Um, so specifically, we have a secondary amine reacting and probably should be a minus H2O here, but if that's not always explicitly written, so you can't count on that necessarily. Um, we're going to be replacing the oxygen with a nitrogen, but because it's a secondary nitrogen, we can't just make, we're not, not gonna make the imine where we wind up with a carbon nitrogen double bond. So our intermediate has that double bond. But a nitrogen with four bonds is not very stable because it's got a positive charge. It's not a very neat drawing, but you can see, I think you can tell what the structure is, right? Um, and so this was that, that one that went through an extra rearrangement to turn it into an e enamine. You're going to basically bump that pi bond over to the adjacent carbon and lose a hydrogen here. So that leaves and you wind up with
and probably actually going to be the the z product but i just didn't leave myself enough room to drop that way or sorry the e product hang on one second day all right so questions on this one I'm just going to ask about the E versus Z thing. So it mainly just sterics you're looking at? That I mean, that's that's always a good first guess, unless unless you're otherwise, you're told specifically that a mechanism has something else. Usually for these elimination reactions, um, you would just be looking at, at sterics, um, unless there's some other piece of the puzzle. So that's where they fell out. Where were they? They're in back. And, and they're all supposed to go in here. Can you put all the ones that don't match in there? All right. We're organizing dice over here on the floor. <laughs> all right. Any other questions on this one? And again, this is not, I was not looking for the E versus Z. That was not the primary part of this, of this um, reaction. Um, so, you know, when, and when in doubt, go with the sterics. All right, we did, we did 10, so nine is the last one we have, right? Um, so again, for starters, if you've got a nitrogen, as your nucleophile, we're going to be trying to make those that carbon nitrogen double bond. We're going to be replacing the oxygen with a carbon nitrogen double bond uh, if it's possible. On the last one, with the secondary amines, you can't do that. So you wind up making the enamine. But with any of the other reaction types, when you have a nitrogen nucleophile, your product is going to look like a carbon nitrogen double bond. All right. So we're not really going to have these fluorines are there, but they don't really have any effect on the reaction. They're going to make the reaction go faster because that's going to having these really strong electronegative groups is going to um, expose the positive charge on that carbonyl carbon more. So it'll affect the rate, but it doesn't affect the product. So our product then. It's going to look here like this. And then we did have a few exceptions to the rules, or not exceptions to the rules, a few of the functional groups that could then go on to do another reaction. Right. So I would immediately, if I if you don't recognize this right off the bat, go back and check, check your notes and look for. I know it's hard to see what's going on when I leave my notes up there, but if yeah, if you make the uh, nitrogen nitrogen compound and expose that to hydroxide water and heat, you just wind up fully reducing it, taking it, and you're just going to replace the nitrogen. You're going to make nitrogen gas as a byproduct and just replace those two carbon nitrogen bonds with hydrogens. All right, so our final product here would just be to chop that off. And then you can draw, since there are new bonds, you can draw the hydrogens, but you don't, strictly speaking, need to for skeletal structure, right? Is there implied? Yeah, where do these ones go? All right. So that's that's the reaction section, which is by volume at least the bulk of this test.
Um, if you look at the individual points, it's still going to be it's going to be very similar um, points wise for, uh, to the practice test. So forty points on what's really twenty reactions, right? So each of these reactions is only two points a piece. Um, so in terms of test taking strategy, I would make sure that so section one you should be able to get close to all the points, right? And it's only gonna be worth, it's a total of 25 points, but you should be able to get close to all of them and it should go pretty quickly because it's gonna be a lot of ranking things, counting pi electrons. Um, and then part three, the, the mechanisms, those actually, there's only three mechanisms and they're each worth 10 points apiece. So in terms of the amount of time to spend on these, you're probably, your mechanisms in section three and your part, your section one is going to be where you get the most points per minute. If you want to think about it that way, in terms of being efficient with your time, in case you run out of time. Um, I'm not saying totally leave the reactions blank, but don't start, don't go start looking up reactions that you don't recognize until you've gotten through the mechanisms. I would go quickly through the reaction section all the ones that are easy, all the low hanging fruit that you recognize the reaction type right away, get those done fast. Anything you don't recognize when you first look at it, skip it and come back to it later. Then do your mechanisms thoroughly, get all your points on your mechanisms. Because if, you're, if you can recognize the mechanism, you should be able to get close with an open book test, you should be able to get close to full credit on the mechanisms, right? because you just got to figure out which one it is. And then it's just a matter of copying what's in the textbook or in your notes or the slides. Uh, and then there will be a five point wildcard section. And I might leave that till the end because you know how the wildcard questions can get as far as the amount of time that they take sometimes. Um, but so that, that would be my approach. You guys know yourself and what you're, best at if you're if you've got these reactions down and you want to get all of your 70 points for the reactions and mechanisms before you even look at section one be my guest that might work really well for you um, because none of the individual sections in section one or the wild card are worth that many points on their own compared to the mechanisms um, but that's just me giving you unsolicited advice so take that as you will Make your own decisions. Anything else you guys wanted to go over on the practice test? Covered just about all of it. Um, and with most of us here and this being recorded, I don't think I'm going to go to the trouble of writing out the key and uploading it separately. Um, as long as if, if uh, you guys can't watch the video for some reason, I can always um, do that later. But I'm trying to be efficient with my time too. Um, so as long as you guys have everything you need in this review session, when it comes to the practice test, uh, I'm not going to write it out separately. All right. Well, then we only went, we went 15 minutes over, but we started 15 minutes late. So that was just about perfect timing, right? Um, I do have office hours in 25 minutes. If you want to come back and get more help on any of these sections privately, um, feel free to, from, uh, 1030 to, 10.30 to noon, uh, I have office hours. Uh, and if I'm not sitting right in front of my computer when you log in, just hang out. I always have the, the tone, the ding doorbell turned on on the Zoom. So I'll know when you show up. All right, then I'll stop this. And uh, you guys, I won't say good luck because that implies that, that you guys need luck. You guys put in the work. This is just your chance to show me. All right, have fun.